Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. My name is Jasper. I am a member of Intel Antwerp. Um, I will be moderating the discussion tonight. We have invited uh, two very interesting speakers to our webinar tonight. Uh, first of all, Fairus uh, Sharkawi. Um, she will talk about Palestine uh, in times of the pandemic. Um, she'll be able to tell us more about developments on the ground, um, about the impact of the of the of the Corona pandemic and the occupation on the on the daily life of Palestinians. Um, so Fairus is the coordinator of uh, Grassroots Al Quds, um, which is a platform for Palestinian communi ba community based mobilization, uh, leadership and advocacy in occupied Jerusalem. Um, the organization maps and networks in order for Palestinian communities in Jerusalem to resist the Israeli policies of displacement. And then secondly, I would like to present Alice Samson Estape. Um, Alice is the coordinator of the BDS movement in Europe and she has been organizing and coordinating campaigns uh, against the international complicity with the Israeli occupation for a couple of years. Um, she will tell us more about this complicity um, by focusing on the investments of AXA um, and about the campaign that has been launched to make uh, the company divest. Um, Fairuz, let me just move to you straight away. Um, so first of all, can you explain to us how the COVID-19 situation in Palestine has evolved since the first infections were detected? Um, so how hard, how hard has the virus hit Palestine? Um, what kind of measures were taken to curb a big outbreak and were they effective? What is the situation like uh, today? Uh, good evening. Thank you for hosting us tonight. And thank you for the introduction, Jasper. Uh, I think that to answer your question, we need to first of all realize that there are different parts of Palestine that uh, have different uh, realities. Uh, people living in, in, in the different occupied parts of Palestine have different, different uh, direct realities, political, economic, uh, uh, socioeconomic. And so the, the COVID-19 pandemic also took different shapes in, 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 in Palestine. So, for example, uh, um, the Gaza Strip has been under siege for over 13 years now. And of course, the, the daily uh, uh, reality in, in Gaza is a very harsh one. It's, it's uh, almost an, an inhumane place to live and people face a lot of challenges including uh, uh, of course the closure and and uh, and the, the restriction on, on movement and development but also uh, the lack of uh, medicine and medical centers and and devices uh, um, and that is the usual uh, reality in in gaza so the covid 19 brought a lot of uh, fear towards what's going to happen in in gaza for example and luckily there wasn't a big uh, a huge outbreak of covid 19 cases in in the gaza strip uh, looking at the areas uh, um, under direct Israeli, not, all, not only occupation, but also uh, um, uh, control bureaucratically and legally uh, in the 48 occupied uh, uh, territories, in the 48 occupied land, Palestinians uh, um, uh, faced uh, uh, neglect and uh, uh, there were a lot of Palestinian, there was a lot of Palestinian criticism over the Israeli authorities that did not uh, uh, offer and provide enough uh, testing kits and enough uh, uh, remedy to the uh, uh, situation, including also economically. But then looking at uh, uh, Jerusalem, for example, where I live and, and I am I, uh, uh, currently uh, speaking from, uh, uh, there was both the, the, the occupation, the military occupation, business continuing as usual, and I will elaborate on this uh, 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 in, a, in a bit. Uh, so the, the, the things you mentioned, home demolitions, arrests and prosecution of Palestinians, um, uh, the, the continuous and even speeded up uh, uh, annexation plan and implementation of the annexation, this is the reality that we lived in Jerusalem. Um, and then uh, there, uh, there is the West Bank, where in the West Bank, uh, uh, supposedly at the face of it, the Palestinian Authority was 
uh, uh, in control. But of course, the Palestinian Authority was following orders, as usual, uh, uh, from the Israeli authorities. And that is why what we witnessed happening in the West Bank was the Palestinian Authority policing the Palestinian people, uh, imposing restrictions on movement, preventing people from opening uh, 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 their businesses or going out in the street. And this is not to say that was not a good measure, but uh, the, the, the Palestinian Authority's role stopped there. It stopped at policing the people without providing any remedy to the people, without providing the means to help the people survive. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to the West Bank, the, the, the statistics already show that there are uh, um, 100,000 new poor families in, in the West Bank. This is a huge number, uh, and, and poverty is rampant in the West Bank, it's not it's not a new development, but the huge jump in the number of, of uh, 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 poor families reflects uh, uh, and indicates how poorly the Palestinian Authority reacted to the pandemic in terms of supporting the people economically and uh, uh, making sure that people are not paying the price uh, uh, during this this very harsh time. Uh, and and this is what uh, that's exactly the result. This huge number of new poor officially poor families uh, was a result of that. So uh, to, to summarize this uh, uh, divided answer, it, it, it really depends on what part of Palestine we are talking about and uh, um, what is the, the, the political situation there, the legal situation there. What's common between all of these different parts is that the Palestinians, uh, you know, the Palestinians live a, a, a long-term pandemic, that is the Israeli occupation, and any new challenge, uh, whether it is the COVID-19 or any other uh, global or regional development, uh, will add trouble to the Palestinians' challenges. And so it is double trouble for the Palestinians. How it reflected itself in the specific realities, uh, I tried to explain shortly, but in, in general, what's common is being occupied and then hit with a pandemic means that challenges were just doubled and, and harshened, and it is very challenging for the Palestinian people these days. Mm -hmm. So you talked about a couple of, of, of disturbing, disturbing stories already. Uh, you, yeah, you, 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 you mentioned some examples of, of what, if, what, it, what it means to be occupied in times of a pandemic. But is it possible to be a little bit more specific in terms of healthcare? So um, how, how does the occupation basically prevent um, an effective, an effective response to, uh, to, to this pandemic? Uh, yes, uh, uh, certainly. The, the Israeli occupation authorities uh, uh, naturally don't put the Palestinians on top of their priority list. And when it comes to providing the needed uh, um, uh, test kits and uh, um, health centers and, and any health-related measures uh, uh, within the context of a pandemic, uh, uh, very little was uh, uh, provided to the Palestinian uh, communities. And uh, for example, in Jerusalem, uh, um, we, we witnessed a lot of cases of not only that the Israeli uh, 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 authorities did not provide that uh, uh, these measures and reactions in the Palestinian communities, but also harassed and prosecuted and prevented grassroots initiatives that grew within these communities and organized themselves in order to provide that uh, uh, remedy to the uh, and, and assistance to the communities. So, for example, uh, a, a clinic in Silwan in the middle of Jerusalem uh, um, opened uh, its doors to and, and provided testing kits for people. Uh, um, there were little to no testing kits in the Palestinian communities in the first few weeks in, of, of the pandemic and since the, the outbreak. And so uh, uh, it was a, a, a self uh, uh, effort. Indeed, in this case, the Palestinian Authority was, uh, uh, was involved. Uh, uh, and that is why the, the, the Israeli occupation authorities shut down this clinic and prevented the testing from taking place uh, as part of its usual reaction to any Palestinian organizing or Palestinian uh, Palestinians taking responsibility or a lead. They, uh, the Israeli authorities, they, it's very important for them to prove that 
they are the bosses they control Jerusalem all of Jerusalem and so we also saw how they raided Kufur Aqab Kufur Aqab is a Palestinian neighborhood of Jerusalem even though it is within the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem it is now located outside of the wall behind of uh, behind the annexation and expansion wall, Israel wanted to cut off Kufur Aqab from Jerusalem because it is a place with 100,000 Palestinian residents and that's a demographic threat in the Israeli terms. And so uh, Kufur Aqab is neglected. It has been neglected by the Israeli authorities intentionally, systematically for many, many years since the building and the construction of the wall uh, took place in, in the year 2005 in that area. And Palestinians there do not receive the regular services that they are supposed to receive from the uh, from the Israeli uh, authorities including uh, um, building infrastructure sufficient infrastructure providing health services um, and and uh, during the pandemic uh, there there was again a need for organizing in order for this to happen and the Palestinian Authority again hijacked the opportunity to do this show of sending its own police to Kufur Aqab in order to police the people and prevent the people from going out to the streets and that is when Israel saw this as a challenge to its uh, control over Jerusalem, uh, its united undivided eternal capital and they sent actual army forces into uh, uh, Kufur Aqab uh, and uh, again did the show of uh, we are the bosses here, we control this area. And so we witnessed all of these uh, incidents take place. There was a grassroots initiative that was uh, distributing food parcels to families in need because of course the poor and that is through everywhere, the poor paid the most, the highest price of this pandemic everywhere around the world. And so the poor families who uh, did not have any uh, economic security and who suddenly found themselves unemployed against their will uh, uh, were only growing poorer. And so there were uh, uh, many Palestinian initiatives organized all over Palestine where uh, uh, community-based and grassroots uh, groups started uh, gathering donations and uh, distributing food parcels to these families in need and again uh, it happened in Sur Baher in March when the Israeli police arrested uh, uh, some of uh, 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 the volunteers of one of these initiatives they prevented them from distributing the food parcels in the end they did take it uh, take a step back and allow the food parcels to be uh, uh, distributed but this doesn't mean uh, uh, that we can ignore again this show of power so this is to say that uh, uh, when it comes to what it means to be a Palestinian under uh, occupation and then under pandemic, it means that on the one hand, there is the pandemic with the challenges that it brings to the community, to the people. I mean, uh, uh, regardless of the occupation, Jerusalem is a touristic city and 40% of the Palestinian economy in Jerusalem is dependent on tourism. And of course, with the pandemic and the halting of all uh, uh, movement of, of tourists and visitors into Jerusalem, the economy, the Palestinian economy in Jerusalem was hit hard and shops had to close and, and ho hotels had to send away uh, uh, um, fire uh, employees because there is no business and they cannot keep them anymore. And so there is the reg there are the regular challenges that you face as as a community hit with a pandemic. But then again, this this challenge is tr troubled by an occupation that is relentless that continues its business as usual even during the pandemic. And I uh, the last point I want to make there is 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 um, uh, uh, also to, to, to connect this to the larger context we're talking about today, during the pandemic closure we witnessed also an uh, uh, accelerated action and activism uh, uh, when it comes to the annexation plans and the building of infrastructure that supports uh, uh, this annexation. So in Jerusalem, for example, the Israeli occupation authorities took uh, advantage of the empty streets and started working uh, 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 day and night uh, on the infrastructure for the, the new lines of the Jerusalem light rail. There are four new lines that are under construction right now, in addition to the existing 
so-called red line and so uh, and of course these uh, lines all uh, uh, have one main purpose which is to connect settlements around Jerusalem with the city center uh, 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 making annexation happen de facto on the ground uh, even before this uh, uh, suddenly important date of July 1st, 2020. Uh, uh, it's important to realize that this annexation has been taking place for decades now. And I can, again, elaborate on this uh, uh, in a bit. Thank you, uh, Fairis. Um, so another point uh, I, I, I wanted to make or another question. Uh, so you say that the occupation, it basically touches upon every aspect of, of Palestinian lives. Uh, you talked about healthcare. Um, but what about em employment? So um, many Palestinians, they, they work in Israel, they, they work in the illegal, in the illegal settlements to survive basically. Uh, but in the context of the pandemic, um, well, m many, many things happened as well. Um, would you be able to tell us something about Palestinian employment in Israel in the illegal settlements and how that has um, uh, evolved the, the last couple of months, um, what this means for Palestinians? Of course. Uh, well, first of all, as ironic as it, it sounds, Palestinians have been building Israel since 1948, and, and, and that by itself is, is a, a huge thing, point to stop at and, and think about. Uh, the fact that Palestinians find themselves forced to live, uh, to work uh, within the Israeli labor market, within the Israeli uh, construction sector, uh, uh, pandemic or not, it is a an awful uh, uh, thing to have to do. And, and Palestinians, many of them, uh, thousands of them do not have the choice and end up working in the Israeli labor market. Of course, that a, a huge portion of these workers work in the construction sector. And when the pandemic uh, uh, started and uh, the outbreak happened and uh, measurements, measures were taken and uh, uh, many sectors were shut down in, in the economy, in the Israeli economy, the Israeli authorities deemed the sector, the construction sector, an essential sector, just like the health services, just like the food shops, uh, construction was deemed essential, uh, uh, which meant, which was translated into thousands of Palestinian workers having to go to work during this pandemic to serve the Israeli colonial projects and colonial expansion and Israeli long-term plans. Now, these workers, again, even outside of the context of a pandemic, live a very uh, live very challenging conditions. They have. They are the cheap labor. They don't get high salaries. They are easily uh, uh, replaced, take, getting rid of. Um, they don't receive any benefits. They have no rights. It is uh, uh, very easy to find yourself just sent home from, from work. And so in, in, in the reality that preceded the pandemic, the, the, the conditions for these workers were, were uh, harsh. And, now with the pandemic, when the pandemic started and Israel deemed their work essential, they had to risk their health, their lives, their families' health in order to continue going to work. Um, and again, many people wanted to continue to work also, but this again is, is that dilemma, is, it's that uh, uh, um, uh, reality that we all need also to stop at and think about why do certain people in the world find themselves having to make that choice between surviving and risking uh, 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 their lives and their families' lives and health. And so these workers found themselves having to go to work, but then Israel conditioned that if they come from the West Bank to work in, in 48 occupied lands, they will need to uh, um, uh, commit to staying there for 60 days with without going back. So they had to commit to staying there for two months without returning to see their families. But then again, if one of them caught the virus, they found themselves you know, thrown at the checkpoint and just sent back to the West Bank without any uh, care, without any uh, 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 even medical uh, 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 treatment or anything. They were just, uh, 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 they were uh, taken rid of, rid of and they were sent home. So it's it's um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing to see that um, uh, why, I mean, the question here 
to ask here is why is the construction sector more than others uh, very important uh, to Israel and why it wasn't stopped during the pandemic? And again, this connects us to the question about annexation. Um, and here, if you allow me, I would take a step back again and uh, just clarify one point. As a Palestinian living here in Palestine, I can tell you that annexation has been happening on the ground since 1967. I mean, the, 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 the fact that there is a big fuss about the annexation now uh, should not uh, uh, make us forget that this annexation has been happening slowly, steadily, steadily uh, without any disturbance uh, by Israel since the occupation of the West Bank, including Jerusalem in 1967. And uh, uh, it is very easy to see in Jerusalem. Uh, um, only now is Israel talking about annexing officially, legally, some parts of the West Bank, but this had already happened in Jerusalem in 1980, uh, an expansion that started de facto in 1967 when Israel expanded the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem to include the newly occupied parts uh, in the east. And so this is the context, okay? The annexation has been taking place for decades now, and, and this includes also what we know exists in the West Bank already, settlements, which can be residential or industrial, industrial zones, Israeli industrial zones are everywhere in the West Bank, sucking up our natural resources, preventing our own economy from being developed. So the roots, and not only roots, but, but a, big, a huge part of this tree has been growing for so long now. And uh, uh, again, during the pandemic, Israel found a very good opportunity to, to uh, accelerate the, the annexation. And so we um, uh, uh, witnessed uh, not only home demolitions, but also land confiscation, construction in the area called E1, which is part of the uh, uh, um, plan to create a so-called uh, Greater Jerusalem Metropolis. And so it's in, 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 in short, this annexation was accelerated. For the Palestinians, this annexation has been happening on the ground uh, uh, for, uh, for so long. For us, it means that we uh, uh, simply cannot grow in, in, in our communities, simply cannot uh, uh, um, uh, even live a normal uh, uh, relationship with our uh, land, with our community, with our space. Um, and the last point I would like to make here is that this enterprise, this big project that Israel has been implementing in the West Bank cannot, it, 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 Israel alone cannot fund such a big project. And without international aid to Israel, Israel cannot uh, 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 realize these plans. And uh, this aid is not only uh, the $3.8 billion check that the United States of America sends to Israel every year, but rather also uh, uh, is funded by the, the, the business relations that Israel has been building and continues to build with international and multinational corporations that are involved in this enterprise. And here is where, uh, where I will stop. I exceeded my time, I'm sorry, and, and we can listen uh, to Alice talk exactly about that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Fairus, for painting a, a very clear picture. And I think uh, on your last point, I would like to move to Alice because she will talk to us about uh, the international complicity uh, with Israeli apartheid and the Israeli occupation. So uh, like Fairus said, there are many structural issues that sustain the occupation. Um, basically, um, and we won't go into all of these different uh, obstacles, of course, uh, but we would like to specifically focus on the uh, complicity of businesses um, and of AXA insurance in, in, in particular. Um, so before we move on to AXA's complicity in the Israeli occupation, I, I uh, would like to ask you if you could just shortly explain what uh, the BDS movement is for those uh, who don't know. Um, how did it come, come to life? Um, what are, are its strategies, its objectives? Um, and maybe how, how you would judge its impact over the years. Um, yeah, let us start with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's it's an honor to be here and talking next to uh, Feidouz. So thank you, Intel, for 
organizing this and inviting me and I hope that everyone who's listening to us from wherever that you're all that you're all safe um, thank you so much Fedus, for giving such a, a good uh, context and, and explaining so comprehensively what is happening on the ground and just on the note you ended on it's it's so important that people understand that Israel can only maintain its oppression on Palestinians thanks to international support so Israel's continuous impunity of 70 years of ongoing Nakba, the regime of occupation, apartheid, and colonialism over the Palestinian people is held because of the support from the international uh, community, states, companies, artists, etc. But what we see that is happening towards the years is that the, the scales are starting to tip in favor of Palestinian rights because there is a growing isolation towards Israeli apartheid and this is where the BVS movement um, is, is taking place and, and developing and, and where this growing support of Palestinian rights and uh, and more and more rejection toward Israeli apartheid is growing. Now the BDS uh, movement, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement represents the broadest uh, coalition of civil society organizations in in Palestine, where there's trade unions, women's groups, political parties, etc. And um, it, it, this year is going to be the 15th anniversary of the BDS movement of 9th of, of July. And of course, it's it's inspired in, in the South African struggle against uh, apartheid, also in the movement uh, for civil rights in the in the US. And it's, it's important, uh, the date that was chosen um, for the broadest coalition of civil society to ask international community to adopt an active uh, role and actively uh, defend Palestinian human rights was 9th of July, which is a year after The Hague declared that the Israeli apartheid wall is illegal and has to be destroyed and uh, Palestinian families who were affected by its construction had to be, um, had to be compensated. Uh, that was year 2005, it is year 2020, and of course that wall has not only not been demolished, it keeps on being built every single day. Now the BDS movement is a non-violent strategy that reflects, rejects all forms of racism, sexism and discrimination, and calls for Palestinian human rights to be respected. It upholds three very basic demands, to end the occupation and colonization of all Palestinian lands and dismantling the wall, to recognizing the fundamental rights of the Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality and to respect, promote the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties. All of these demands are enshrined in international law. And I think one of the things that's most powerful of the BDS movement is that Israel, as all uh, colonial powers, uh, try. And, and I think Fayouz was explaining it very well, how Palestinian realities are very different and how Palis uh, Israel plays this game of, of giving slightly more rights to some Palestinians than others. And what is so powerful about the BDS movement is that it, is that it represents Palestinians in the diaspora, Palestinians living under occupation in Gaza and the West Bank, and Palestinians living in 48. And of course, what's, what's, what's crucial to understand is that it is led by a Palestinian population. So when there's uh, groups who want to support Palestinian rights but are not ready to endorse the BDS movement, this means that they're not listening to what Palestinians are asking us to do. Um, and what we need to understand is that when we're not joining the BDS movement, we're actually contributing to harm Palestinians. So the very, very basic we could do is to do no harm, is to make sure that our universities, our institutions, companies are not actively involved in Israeli apartheid and are not contributing to oppression of Palestinians. So what, it, what is so powerful about the BDS movement is that it's, it's incredibly empowering. Absolutely anyone can join and it means taking responsibility in the world uh, we live in and to actually adopting a proactive uh, measure to make sure that we're not supporting Israeli apartheid and that it is um, totally isolated and it will have to respect Palestinian rights. Uh, you were asking about the um, 
uh, how it has developed throughout the years. And I think just seeing the amount of attention that Israel dedicates to the BDS movement shows that it's working and shows that, B that Israel cares about the BDS movement and that it's effective and it has, and it has an impact. In spite of the huge uh, repression uh, Palestinians, of course, and groups in solidarity with Palestine face all over the world with the Israeli lobby, which is one of the strongest lobbies in the world, we, we keep on getting victories uh, every single day. And I just wanted to share some that, that we literally got in the last month, taking into consideration that we're under global uh, lockdown. It, it, it is so important. Um, the BDS movement has contributed to mainstream the idea that Israel is in fact an apartheid state. And just today, 47 legal scholars from the UN uh, published a statement uh, stating that if annexation does take place, that this will represent, this will crystallize apartheid in the 21st uh, century. And of course, as Fedus was saying, we know that we know that whether the, 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 the de facto annexation happens or not, we know there is an annexation on the ground. We know that Israel is an apartheid state. But the fact that now UN legal scholars are ready to say this, say this shows just how how far the movement is reaching. And in this statement, uh, it's a very important quote was that the lessons from the past are clear, that criticism without consequences with, will neither forestall annexation nor end the occupation. So we can see that they're starting to talk about effective measures. And here's where the media's movement is calling for sanctions. And Palestinian civil society released three weeks ago a statement calling for effective measures to stop Israel's illegal annexation of the occupied uh, West Bank, such as banning arms trades and military security cooperation with Israel, suspending free trade agreement with Israel, prohibiting all trade with illegal Israeli settlements, and to ensure that individuals and corporate as actors responsible for war crimes and war crimes against humanity are brought to justice. Three days ago, the European Court for Human Rights ruled unanimously, this is the, the highest uh, court, that France's highest court criminal conviction of Israel boycott advocates violates the European Convention of Freedom of Expression. Uh, and just to uh, show uh, a victory regarding corporate complicity, uh, over a month ago, Microsoft, which needs uh, no introduction at all, everyone knows this company, decided to divest from Anivision, which is an Israeli company that, uh, that, that offers its services and has joint companies with the Israeli military offering uh, facial uh, recognition technology, which is so worrying now that in times of COVID, so many governments are going to try to implement. So in such a short period of time, these are the victories we are achieving, and this just shows how powerful the BDS uh, movement is. Mm -hmm. you, you you just mentioned the United Nations statement um, a couple of months back. Uh, the United Nations they also published uh, a list of companies that are complicit in the in the occupation, um, and I think the list includes about a hundred, but maybe a little more uh, companies that. Uh, provide services or at least profit from the occupation um, and there's like uh, a couple of major multinational uh, companies in the list like booking.com airbnb um, and also a couple of, of uh, israeli banks that uh, finance or provide financial services to uh, to, to to basically uh, in the occupation um, and so I was wondering if you could say a few words about this database um, and why it is important that such a list uh, exists um, yeah yeah but before the webinar I just checked and, and this came out February 2020 and it seems so much longer ago like it's before lockdown and it's crazy how how time uh, flies in, in in times of COVID but but yes, as, as you were saying, in February 2020, the UN released this long-weighted database after all the pressure it's, it, it, uh, they were under. And even though we welcome this, this long-weighted uh, list, uh, there's so many companies that are, that are missing. Even so, it is the first concrete step offered by the UN. And it is important to acknowledge this, that, that it's, it's, it's leaving the um, only empty worded resolutions and going to specific and concrete steps. Uh, and this database asks 
that companies should end business with all the companies in this database because they are involved in uh, Israel's illegal uh, settlement enterprise. As you're saying, some of the important uh, companies to highlight are the five Israeli banks that AXA invests in. This is Bank Hapoalim, Bank Lomi, First International Bank of Israel, Mizrahi Tefahot Bank, and Israel Discount Bank, Delta Israel, which is Puma's exclusive licensee in Israel, Shapir, which is CAF's partner for the development of the Jerusalem Light Rail. There's also Delic Group, Egid, General Mills, Motorola, JCB, Alstom, Mekarot, and travel companies such as TripAdvisor, Airbnb, Booking.com, eDreams, and Expedia. Nonetheless, as uh, you just mentioned, there are numerous companies and banks which are directly involved in direct or indirect business activities which are not in the list. Just some of them, G4S, Hewlett Packard, Albert Systems, Caterpillar, Hyundai Heavy Industries, Volvo, Heidelberg Cement, Semex, etc. Uh, many comp companies that are um, detailed in the independent Israeli research group who profits and in the US project of the American Friends Service Committee investigate. All of these companies have to be included in the database and it is unacceptable that any international Israeli company that is complicit in enabling, facilitating or profiting from Israel's regime of oppression enjoys any sort of, of impunity. What is relevant to say also today, which is news from today, is that um, Michel uh, Bachelet, who is the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, just said today that um, she recommends that the Human, Ra Human Rights Council establishes a group of independent experts with a time-bound mandate uh, to report directly to the council for such a purpose and that uh, needs a budget in order to uh, keep on updating this database. So we urge the UN to keep on dedicating time and efforts to listen to civil society initiatives who have been documenting for ages um, all of these companies involved in the settlements and that companies divest from them. Thank you. So you, you, you were saying that there is a couple of Israeli banks in the list uh, to which AXA is connected. So uh, would you be able to, to, to be a little more specific and, and, and talk about AXA's complicity and, and its links with um, these Israeli banks? Um, and there was also an, uh, an Israeli arms manufacturer to which um, AXA is connected. Could you, could you explain uh, uh, these connections? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be to be brief and explain clearly um, access in investments. Um, the good news is, is what I'm going to try to explain and I hope I show is that it's clear that AXA is feeling our pressure and that AXA is responding to our campaigning. The campaign against AXA started three years ago in, in France. AXA is a French company. When activists there learned that AXA was investing in Israel's largest arms manufacturer, Elbit Systems, and in three Israeli banks. Therefore, AXA was, is actively contributing to dispossession, colonization, and Israeli apartheid. Uh, in June 2018, uh, this um, stopped being only a French campaign, and we started the coalition Stop AXA Assistance to Israeli Apartheid. This coalition, to this day, includes groups in Belgium, in Switzerland, in Spain, in France, in Germany, in Italy, and in, and in Ireland. So this campaign has grown at an international uh, level. And what activists have been trying to show is that AXA is not only violating international law, it's only, it's in, even violating its own uh, code of conduct. When uh, activists have been in touch with AXA, AXA has said that they have examined uh, these, these companies and that they do not fall into their um, companies who should be excluded uh, from investing, which is pretty worrisome taking into consideration that AXA has developed specific sector guidelines. And uh, these policies include the following topics, not investing in companies which produce controversial weapons and sanction countries or countries identified as having high levels of corruption or political risk. It is hard to think of a country that has a higher political risk than Israel, yet uh, AXA insists in investing in Israeli companies. A major step in our uh, campaigning was that AXA in December 2018 decided to divest from Elbit Systems, fully owned AXA subsidiary, AXA IM, 
divested shortly after Elbit acquired IME Systems, which is a large cluster bomb manufacturer. It was then when the campaign decided that we needed specific data of access investments and um, the human rights organization, uh, some of us uh, published in July, 2018, the report, which I recommend you all read, AXA Financing War Crimes, which details uh, and explains very well the nature of AXA's investments. At that time, AXA's, um, AXA's sub subsidiary, AXA IM, was investing in four Israeli banks. It had already divested from Elbit Systems and also AXA owned 64% of AXA Equitable Holdings, which was investing over $91 million in the five Israeli banks, which are mentioned in the UN database, and also in Elbit Systems. What we learned um, only last month is that AXA has gone from owning 61% of AXA Equitable Holdings to owning only 9%. And AXA Equitable Holdings has actually dropped the name AXA, so it's now Equitable Holdings and registered as an independent company. Therefore, AXA's involvement in Equitable Holdings has dramatically decreased. So therefore, AXA is no longer even the major shareholder of Equitable Holdings. Even so, the campaign states that AXA should fully divest from Equitable Holdings as long as Equitable Holdings doesn't divest from the Israeli banks and Elbit systems. Uh, regarding AXA IM, which is AXA's fully owned subsidiary, AXA IM no longer invests in Bank Hapwalim, but the bad news is that AXA has tripled its investments in three Israeli banks. Therefore, the pressure on the campaign, of course, uh, remains, and we keep on asking for AXA to fully divest from the Israeli banks and from equitable holdings. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, I will come back to how people will be able to support the campaign uh, at the end of this webinar. Uh, but now uh, let us move on to the to the Q&A, if that's all right uh, to you. Um, we got a question, um, and I also invite people um, to to add their questions to the Q&A if they if they have some. So um, Martin asks: uh, Is there a possibility for the Palestinian people in Gaza Strip to receive medical help? Um, material and medical aid from outside, so from other countries in the world to fight to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, I don't know, is this is this a question for you, Fairus? Uh, do you feel okay? <laughs> I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the truth is, again, it is uh, an ongoing reality for many, many years now in, in Gaza that it's really hard to get anything into Gaza, including essential materials um, uh, that the people so desperately need. And that includes right now also t treatment or uh, 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 equipment, medical equipment uh, uh, regarding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, this usually is done by um, I, I am, uh, I think, international uh, NGOs that are involved in this. They have to coordinate uh, um, this um, this task uh, with the Israeli occupation authorities. It is really hard to send something, anything, uh, including money or even most importantly money uh, freely into Gaza as individuals and and so if if, if someone is interested is if Martin is interested in in helping with that then I suggest you uh, 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 look it up uh, uh, make a little research and see what uh, organizations are involved in in that if I am not mistaken map was one of those organizations. I know they did a fundraiser for COVID-19 reaction in Palestine. I, I am guessing that included Gaza as well. But I would like to take the opportunity again uh, uh, to, to make a, a, another point or an additional point. I think that it is very important and it is appreciated by Palestinians that people are looking for ways, ways to aid to send aid to the Palestinian people at the same time there is a lot more and this is exactly what uh, uh, um, Alice was hinting at and I am sure she will talk a little bit more about what people can actually do there is a lot that people can do 
aside from or in addition uh, uh, to sending aid to the Palestinian people, whether it is donations or medical equipment. Uh, 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 people usually tend to forget how much they can do from home at home. There is a lot that people can do in their own countries, and that is pressuring corporations and companies to divest from Israel, to cut the, those relations and, 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 and uh, start put, putting morality and justice ahead of profit and economic profit. But in, in addition to that also, I, I think that people can always do a self-check of their own government, of their own system, and how this system, how this government is using your voice and using your taxpayer money also to support Israel. Israel. I think that, yes, our focus tonight is on international corporations and companies. At the same time, political change needs to be done also in Europe or uh, in, in order to support the Palestinian people. It is about foreign policy that people can affect. Uh, uh, so many governments are dealing with Israel as well, not only companies, and I'm talking about economic terms. So I think that uh, um, it's important, aside from finding a way to give that immediate response to a crisis, people also need to check ways of how they can uh, uh, be responsible, how they can hold their own government and their corporations responsible and accountable and pressure them not to take part in, in, in the colonial uh, uh, project uh, that's taken place here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. That, that is why I hope people will, will especially have a look uh, at the campaign and, and, and if, they, if, if they can support it uh, later on. Um, so uh, one more thing I would like to add, and as a, as, a, as, a, as a bit of an answer to Martin's question, so uh, Viva Salud, the NGO I work at, we, we work with partners in Gaza, and so um, we, we, we set up a campaign uh, just a couple of uh, well, months ago already, but to support the work of our partners in Gaza uh, in the context of the corona pandemic. So I invite people to, to have a look on the website and... and they can support uh, that way as well. Um, so let me move to another uh, question. Um, Alice, maybe one for you. Uh, so um, like I mentioned in my introduction, um, there have been massive uh, waves of protests these last couple of weeks in solidarity with, um, with the killing of the police killing of George uh, Floyd. So um, the, the shocking event, it looks like it has clearly uh, struck a nerve with, with people from around the world. Um, and so in early June, a Palestinian with autism was killed by Israeli police uh, as well. Um, so there were some protests uh, I heard and the hashtag Palestinian Lives Matter as well uh, was trending, but hashtags aside, uh, can you explain maybe what the links between these two uh, events uh, would be or why is it important that the people see the connections between these two uh, events? Sure, I, I think that uh, at a time when um, European citizens were inspired by the Black Lives Matter uprising in the US and uh, trying to challenge the ugly legacy of, of European colonialism here too, as, as Fairuz was saying, it, it, it's, it's a matter of trying to connect the dots and still in so many places, racism and colonialism is shown as something from the past and it's not acknowledged and treated as something that is very current, uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that directly affects so many lives in the world and, and so many people are treated as if they don't uh, deserve the full menu of rights and treated as, as second class citizens. I think uh, it, it, it's, it's so inspiring uh, what's happening and it gives us um, a huge opportunity to show how what the work we've been trying to do for ages is that the Palestinian struggle is part of the anti-racist, uh, anti-colonialist struggle. And um, it, it, it's important for, for those struggling in, in the US and in, in the belly of the beast um, to, to, to find the echo and support all around the world, but not just to, sh I think in Europe, one of the problems we're facing is that many people are like, oh yeah, the US is so racist and not, not acknowledging what is happening in Europe, seeing how the Mediterranean has been turned into the, the, a huge uh, mass grave, uh, how, um, how black and brown people are treated uh, in Europe, how the, how the 
police is a racist uh, structure in itself, uh, institutional discrimination. So I think this uh, gives us an opportunity to, again, as always, as activists, uh, revise um, the internalized racism we must struggle against, but also to demand for concrete and specific actions that make sure that uh, everyone's rights are respected and to show the institutional support that enables this continuous um, discrimination. Um, in Spain, where I'm based at, there during the pandemic, I think the pandemic has revealed uh, so much, right? And he has showed so many things that were already happening, but in a very clear way. And uh, we've had uh, migrants who come to work here to um, in, in, in fields who were sleeping on the street uh working in, in food and being uh food that is later transported to all these people who are now under lockdown and there was a football player from monaco who wanted to um to provide uh sheltering so that these people weren't sleeping on the streets and over 13 hotels said that they even if he was going to pay in advance did not want his money uh and and did not want to uh shelter migrants so i think uh, we need to use this opportunity to connect the dots to show how racism and colonialism is operating absolutely everywhere in the US, in Europe, and how it enables and maintains Israeli apartheid. So I think this we need to use this inspiring moment to even more show how justice and freedom for ev absolutely everyone must be achieved. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Fairus, I have one last question um, from Fiona. Um, well, she asks. She asks. Well, she says the last couple of years um, we have seen a resurgence of, of uh, more or less organized Palestinian uh, resistance against Israeli apartheid and occupation, um, and so especially with the Great March of Return, um, the weekly protests. Um, that started in 2018, um, and she asks, how do you judge the, the prospect for Palestinian uh, resistance? Um, well, this is a, a big question. <laughs> uh, but let me start by saying that Palestinian resistance and organizing has been happening as long as the occupation uh, existed. Uh, it might be more exposed than Fiona heard about it recently, but um, uh, the, 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 the organizing in our community and the resistance to the occupation started with the occupation. I mean, take the first intifada as an example uh, that I personally like always to, to go back to because the first intifada, which is the first general Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation, which started in 1987 and, and basically was killed by uh, the signing of the Oslo Agreement in 1993. The first Intifada was a very inspiring example of very efficient and, and, and inspiring uh, community organizing where communities were relying on themselves to, to lead the change, to lead the, 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 um, the struggle, uh, to, to provide mutual aid and, and, and a, a network of safety and security to, to community members. These are all very nice uh, 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 and very good examples of, of uh, um, Palestinian resistance that uh, 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 has has hope, and uh, I have to say that following the Oslo Agreement in 1993 uh, and later Oslo II in 95, and the uh, 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 flooding uh, uh, of uh, international NGOs into Palestine and development projects and international aid money has affected a lot the Palestinian resistance and the Palestinian grassroots organizing, and I think that for many years they. That, that this movement uh, um, was uh, a, a bit confused by this influence, was overwhelmed by uh, by this presence, and uh, uh, um, but I think that it, um, uh, very soon after it sobered up and people realized that as much as this international aid looks like it is helping for the Palestinian people, there are many challenges within the international aid system itself. And so in, in recent, <coughs> sorry, in recent years, I would say that we are witnessing 
<clears throat> the growth of more grassroots initiatives that believe first and foremost in our ability and responsibility of leading our struggle, of dictating the rules of our struggle, rather than following uh, 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 foreign uh, agendas and uh, uh, dictated agendas by uh, donors in this case. So what I'm saying is there is always hope to resistance. Uh, there, is, there is no way that Palestinians lose hope uh, I think that <clears throat> we have a long history of resistance that is inspiring, that is fueling all the time uh, its continuity. And um, I, I think that uh, we will only see uh, a, a, a bigger network because we also see now how these Palestinian grassroots initiatives that are born in, in def different separate places uh, are also starting to build bridges and networks and start to cooperate and coordinate and work together, uh, uh, looking for ways to support each other, looking for ways to uh, um, exchange resources and knowledge and start building together, dreaming together and building together. Uh, so if you ask me, I am a hopeful person and I certainly see that in the future, this resistance will eventually uh, succeed and bring freedom, liberty, and self-determination to the Palestinian people. I'm, I'm very glad to hear, uh, really. Um, so I think it's up to us to, to, to very much support uh, that struggle, that resistance, the, the initiatives that are growing uh, on the ground in, in Palestine, I would say. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ip sc.ie forward slash podcast for more news analysis events and ways in which you can take action see our website at www.ipsc.ie thank you for listening and you'll be hearing from us again soon